Now, we're coming live now from um, the gardening show, and we'll just wait for a few people maybe to start joining there as they normally do. Um, six people on there. So, yeah, so everyone, you're very welcome there to the gardening show. We're um, very lucky this week we're joined by Robbie Borden. Robbie is um, somewhat of a hard man to track down when it comes to He's always giving talks on, you know, without sampling soil or every time you talk to him, he's giving a talk on soil nutrition and talking to farmers and gardeners about improving soil health and cover crops and a wealth of knowledge. So, actually, to pin him down for this now was a big task. So, Robbie, I'm very, very welcome oh. to the show. And, uh, guys, if you let us know where you're from, and he is up around um, the loud area, yeah. give Robbie the thumbs up there. Yeah. Give them a bit of support and let us know where you're from, send them into the comments. So, Darby, you're pretty welcome. And um, you might introduce yourself there. I know you have um, bachelor's or master's in ag science and mm. nutrition and um, soil. Well, thanks a million, Ollie, and, and thanks for the for the kind words. I think the 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 being hard to get is down to more bad organization on my part, Ollie, than than, than being in demand. But uh I know. Look, I suppose the background was I, I would have done my initial training in in agricultural science uh, many years ago. But uh, as I keep saying to you, I think we we all learn more when we're out and about, and and doing whatever work we're involved in. So uh, I suppose you, you get a basis in it. But I suppose um, with with uh, with your focus and and it's a fantastic one. In fairness to you, with the Better Plants um, website and 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 your uh, garden um, videos. It, it's enlightening people or at least educating them about the importance of this so and i think earlier on tonight you mentioned um soil, soil health to me so that's probably where i'd uh, at least try and maybe point some people in that direction if if um, if, if that's what you'd like or if you have any other suggestions yeah. Ollie, you should... no, no I, I think that's very important because we are kicking into the um, the the growing season now and really getting into like people are going to be planting their spuds now and potatoes barely potatoes now from the 17th on i know a lot of people have them in already but you know people are starting to get the uh, working in the soil and you know i've seen over the years myself like i went through years where i felt myself personally one of my polytones was deficient in something and i couldn't put my finger on it i just didn't have the same crop as i did the previous year and i was scratching my head and again look at it, it was only till i got you know a bit more knowledgeable about managing that nutrition that's needed for the soil and nutrients that's needed for the soil that you know make a massive, massive difference so i suppose i suppose telling people a little bit about you know you know stuff like you hear these green manures uh, you know organic matters and stuff like that so we even start off with green manures and that like what is yeah, a green manure yeah. there for people? yeah yeah well I'm, i might I just i suppose we, green manures to me are a big part of how we improve and increase soil health and protect soil so and just the, the, the whole area and i suppose the definition or the most commonly used definition of, of soil health because it it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people would be the ability for the soil to to conduct or to deliver its functions and in some cases that's food production production in some cases it's actually water infiltration so it gives us a lot of clean water and access to clean water and it provides many other materials for food and fiber and clothes as we you know food is only one of the one of the things it does um the eu is starting to take a very serious uh, look at this now and there's now a new mission out there called the soil health initiative or the soil health mission and again any any citizen of the eu can get involved in that and contribute to some of the the, the stakeholder involvement groups to, to, to feed in the, the interest in it but it'll just show you how important it's now being realized and it's long overdue i know people like yourself and myself ollie have spoken about soil health for a long time but uh, and I suppose then just to, to to clarify that then I suppose we 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 to tie in with yourself is the old saying we would have always had in, in talking to farmers and horticulturalists and gardeners was healthy soils, uh, healthy plants, healthy yeah. people. So I I think considering we, have, we we'll have to change that to healthy and better plants. So healthy soil, <laughs> uh, healthy, healthy and better plants, and uh, healthy yeah. people. And that's the truth of it. And if you go back, look the the the, the, old, the old quotes attributed to. Um, uh, Hippocrates, whether it's true or not, has let food be thy medicine. So again, I think the home gardeners, the people who grow their own produce at home, they really understand this area of you know clean, healthy, uh, natural food and 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 the vitality and energy it gives, as well as just nourishing bodies. So I suppose green manures, 
It won't, we, we look at it from a number of different things, Ollie. Some people call them catch crops, cover crops. And again, they call them catch crops because they'll actually catch the nutrients over the winter and not let them leach out of the soil into the water courses. And again, there's a monetary value to that as well as uh, uh, we should all be trying to protect our environment anyway. And it's one of the things we would recommend any of the gardeners we would work with, we'd always say to them over the winter, definitely start getting your green manures in, your cover crops, because as to, to protect soil from, from heavy rainfall and, and, and erosion and even nutrient leaching. Now, look, the, the thing then to be conscious of that is that I suppose it can, depending on the varieties and species that people grow, try and avoid what you're growing as food crops because then it keeps a very decent rotation going and protects the, it doesn't lead to any pests or disease, maybe uh, increases. But in saying that, you can maybe start to see sometimes little things like an increase in slug populations. But again, it depends on the crops you pick. So it's a yeah. learning experience as we go along, but a very valuable a very valuable resource to, to, to protect soil and, and increase soil health. And in fairness, in the last number of years, you'll hear more and more about what they call the liquid carbon pathway. And basically the functions of a plant is to take in the solar radiation, yeah. which is free and combine it with the likes of, uh, you know, oxygen and, and, and uh, uh, basically taking in minerals and, and nutrients from the soil, which is really only about how it's carbon and oxygen and, and minerals. And all of a sudden you have a, a food product, but really, I suppose when it's doing that, it's actually, it's, it's pumping sugars up, up and down through the plant. And a lot of those sugars are being sent to the root zone. And a lot of those sugars in the root zone are then being excreted out or secreted out into the soil. That all feeds the microbes, which then starts to work on releasing more um, nutrients to feed back into the plant. So again, that's the real sign of, I suppose, a healthy a healthy ecosystem. But again, those cover crops, so they're doing three and four very important jobs yeah. for us as gardeners or farmers that maybe they're, they're, not, they're not getting credit for. So I think I definitely encourage anyone to start looking at it and, and really working hard on green manures. I don't like to see bare soil over the, the autumn and winter yeah. months because it's very, sometimes, sometimes it's not easy to see with the naked eye what the amount of damage that can be done. And we don't think we're doing harm. And in fairness, over the years, in some cases, there was recommendations to leave soil bare over the autumn because mm -hmm. it helped to prepare the ground physically for planting the following spring. But we would find that a cover crop will do it amazing a job on freeing up the soil and work and uh, you know you'll be you'll actually think somebody walked the soil for you that's that's our experiences with them so yeah, that's probably cover crops and green manures in a nutshell ollie yeah yeah it is no absolutely and it is something like we talked about it last year and, and before that it is something you know especially especially with the, the rise in polytons because especially if you're leaving you know if you've raised beds in polytons and you're leaving them non-active from even september right through till january yeah. february yeah. going into yeah. march it's a long time for it getting yeah. there, they're drying out, the soil is getting more. So definitely get them in and keep keep that rotation going. So again, then organic matter, then I suppose the importance of that going into the soil with say your compost and stuff. Because again, the reason why I say it because you know, I know when I was learning all this, I didn't have a clue at the start. And I'm sure there are people listening saying, you know, and they're reading these little one-liners on um, some of the other, you know, they're, they're great, the Facebook pages and all that. Someone is talking yeah. about green manure or organic matter. And they say, what the hell is organic matter? And, you know, it, it, you know, someone said to me, oh, is that organic fertilizer? And I said, no, it's just an organic matter that the worms and the soil can break yes. down. It, it's yeah. an organic substance to the soil. So that, that's what we're going to just touch on a bit of organic matter there yeah. for them. Well, the way, again, we'd look on organic matter, it's, it's vital for a healthy function in soil, and the higher, the better. Uh, I, you know, I suppose there's caveats to all these things, but we would find the big difference, if you take most till soils over the last 50, 60 years, and if you, so if you're in a garden uh, and you went to the hedge and took some soil out of the hedge, it'll probably be lower in NPK than the soil, may even be lower in pH, but you're almost guaranteed it could be 100% higher in organic matter. So in essence, over if you're tilling, whether it's a garden or a, a polytunnel or, or that's not getting sort of a, maybe organic uh, compost amendments returned every year, or a, you know, a field scale veg or field scale garden scale uh, fruit or veg production, these crops are removing, as well as removing nutrients, 
if you're you know constantly tilling it and leaving it unprotected you will start to see some of this organic matter disappearing and why is it important for for, for gardeners and food production it's it's like this uh, it's a sort of a win-win in in dry weather it'll hold more moisture to give you more moisture available to crops and in wet weather it'll actually allow uh, moisture to sort of uh, how would i say st store it properly and let it drain away but it it's it's really you know in 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 the higher organic matter soils you that are less disturbed it's it's amazing the way it works because the less disturbance we do um, you tend to see far more fungal hyphae being, being, being built in these soil microbe communities. And that in its own right will act as a sort of a, a reservoir. It'll stop rain just running through too quickly and, and, and yeah. or a, a run, run off. So again, we think it's vital. The way we encourage people to do that is feed your, feed your soil to increase your organic matter. So again, you have a couple of great products there yourself, Ollie. Um, basically, to, to 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 feed both the soil and the, the likes of the earthworms to, to to keep working these things in soil. If people are making their own compost, returning that to the soil is a brilliant thing. If you know, if they're you know providing the compost properly and there's very little chance of maybe disease carry over. You know, any of those residues. That's what the that's what the microbes and the so things like earthworms love. They like that. They bring it down, and as well as bringing it down to feed on, it's it's opened up aeration channels. It's helping with drainage. So that's one of the big ones we'd look at, yeah. And and in fairness, uh, the bounce in soil will even get better as the organic matter rises. So you know, it, it's it's a real good indicator of soil health, as is uh, the likes of a, a simple one, earthworms. And and again, there's caveats to all these, but in general, at a, at a sort of a start off level, they're all good indicators of of, of soil health. You know. Yeah. So, Actually, more into that than there, what is the ideal soil for carrots? Is there an uh, ideal soil for carrots? Uh, one without lots of pure, rocks, pure, anyway. Well, it, 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 this, is, this is probably one of the, 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 I'm not saying the sad realities of modern, modern uh, farming. The ideal soil considered for carrots to, to probably grow, to sell and market is, is, is very sandy soil because the carrots, there's no obstacles to them growing sort of very straight down and then to fill out nice and everything looks. We, 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 we subscribe to the, to the model that uh, uh, it doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to taste pretty and, uh, you know, be wholesome. So again, look, we grow carrots here on our own soil, Ollie. It's, it's, we don't do anything overly special for it. There's stones in it. A, a, a lot of the bigger growers would probably be de-stoning or at least, you know, yeah. getting most of the big ones out of the way. And that's all, again, just to grow these straight carrots. So just to answer Maureen's question, really, they, they do like sort of more drier soil. So the sandier soil tends to drain more. It might need a little bit of, you know, bit of water than if you come into a very dry period because of, you know diseases like botrytis and 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 uh, white mold and things like that those type of you know sort of very the, the like the wet and, and and damp weather so i suppose carrots in in their own essence the drier the soil the better but at the same time from a home gardening point of view no issues with really and truly any type of soil in in, in my opinion there's actually Margaret just asking there about um, how often would you feed your soil and I suppose your your home garden again and, and raised beds and how often would well, you give them that? We'd probably look at uh, talking about feeding soil at once if not twice a year in the extent that you might do something like some of your uh, pellets uh, uh, Ollie, at the start of a season and then maybe towards the end of the season if you've composted your waste on on in the garden or in the bottom of the garden that you're coming back out with that type of material and it's it's then allowed to you know and even get a, a cover crop into that then before anything uh, before it gets too too late in the winter and again that's that's so we'd see it as a, it's a sort of a continuous thing but from the point of view of where people think of feeding soil We'd say something in, in the start, because this is why we like the natural fertilizers, the, no, the non-chemical, but the natural, because the, as well as feeding, we'll say you're trying to feed your crop, whether it's carrots or cabbage or spuds, you're, you're actually, you're feeding the soil as well, and you're feeding the microbes, and you're feeding the earthworms, you're feeding the, the micro and macro fauna. So, you know, instead of just getting something with an NPK in it, you're getting something yeah. with you know that naturally carries a bit of n a bit of p and a bit of k plus calcium sulfur boron molybdenum magnesium all the goodies that 
that a lot of these, and especially especially for the home gardeners, if you're trying to store um, your veg, calcium is such an important nutrient. Potash is such an important nutrient. And keeping nitrogen levels fairly low to allow you to store those uh, yeah veg a bit longer or the last a bit longer so calcium is probably one of the big ones for the home garden and it's important for if you talk to a commercial grower of carrots he's very tuned into getting his calcium levels right and the same with lettuce they're avoiding tip burn so it's for all for storage and storability but uh, i hope that answered uh, margaret's yeah, question no, I that actually brings us into what we were talking about earlier on was about you know just overfeeding the soil with nitrogen and you know, because over overdosing in nitrogen is, is is nearly as bad as under nitrogenizing soil or putting yeah. too little yeah. nitrogen in the soil. So, you know, like even like if you are, you know, it's about like it's it just again that's why I like the mushroom pellets. They are, um, you know, they encourage the worm activity. They're full of, you know, they're nice and low in the DMP thing. Okay, there's plenty of organic matter there, and yeah. the the salt yeah. and the worms yeah. popping in it. Yeah. On, on our farm at home, we'd use mushroom compost as part of the fertilizer for the growing of grass and crops. We use things like poultry manure, poultry manure pellets. So we, we, we'd we use all those things as well as in the garden and with gardeners locally, we'd use them on, on commercial farms. So it's all about, we're trying to get to this fertilizer that carries more than just uh, NPK. But in saying that, and that's why we'd say to people, it's, it's a good thing to maybe start with a soil test. And we find a lot of gardens don't test low for NPK because they've been getting, you know, fairly good returns of, of nutrients over the years. And organic matter tends to be on the decent side. So we, we sort of say an excess is as bad or can be as bad as a deficiency. Most people test their soil to identify deficiencies. pH, calcium, magnesium being the sort of two, the, the big ones to start with, and then PK. Nitrogen, we find it's, it's easy picked up. It tends to be in the, it's in the atmosphere. A lot of plants can can take it in, especially the legumes, but so too can other plants. So we tend to always then try and say, look, you need to keep your nitrates in the plant under, you know, under control. So that could be you might start with a soil analysis, try and balance them out. You could discover that it's the zinc you're missing, or maybe potash. You know, you might like to increase your potash levels a bit. You don't have to overdo it, but it could be bore on your lacking, which might influence how we take up more nitrogen and K. It, again, if you're finding that nitrogen's a big problem and your crops are growing too quickly and are too lush and you're getting disease and yeah. lots of problems, yeah. it may be a couple of foliar sprays of, of magnesium or putting a magnesium source into the soil to counterbalance that because they all have an effect and sulfur is very important. Nitrogen to sulfur ratios, it's probably for a different, it's a, it's a, you could be talking about these things all night, but, but to balance the nutrients is quite, what well, no, but is quite important. And I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm just giving some sort of what I would call key, key points on it. So if like there's people out there and they're putting out lots of NPK and their pH is all wrong. So their soil, like, it's naturally not even functioning like you know in, in the agricultural world there's research in ireland proven that you know if your ph is at the correct figure uh we'll say 6.4 ish and i know some of the veg crops like it up as high as seven but the, if you are but sub optimum on that figure you'll actually lack in 80 kilos per hectare of available nitrogen from the soil so that's a lot mm -hmm. of nitrogen that's you know, pretty much 35 kilos per, per acre and double that, that's that's the equivalent of 70 units. So that's a lot of nitrogen. And the French would have data showing that if your pH goes up above seven, the nitrogen fixes in the soil work better. So again, we have to be co cognizant of that. But my point is, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, I, I'd rather see a lot of gardens at a pH of around six and a half versus, and medium P and K, rather than seeing gardens with loads of P and K, which is also tied in with nitrogen, and, and a very poor pH. So it's just a bit looking for balance. That's what I find, Ollie. And, no, and ultimately, I think most gardeners, whether we realize it or not, are trying to get to what we call nutrient-dense food, so that your, your kilo of carrots grown in your patch is really full of nutrients and vitality and health given properties like polyphenols and, and antioxidants and they are all influenced by how we feed and, and nourish plants growing so again uh, that's that's a, i think that's a very important aspect of like wh why most people bother to grow their own so 
I think that again, looking for that balance early on, and probably worth looking at an odd leaf analysis or sap analysis during the year to see. Sometimes we'd see soils and they're very high in magnesium, and we test the produce. The produce is very low in magnesium, so sometimes the plants can't get it out of the soil, and it's just to know those little 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 bits and bobs, you know. I know absolutely, because I think actually it was a good few years ago. Um, I was that you hosted. Uh, an event in a farm, but to a scientist up from America, I remember done the rain analysis, and then oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The scientist that was talking there, and she blew me away because she was actually saying, I think in California at the time, they were you know talking about the whole organic um, market versus, and she was saying, well look at if you can prove that your your produce yeah. are more yeah. nutritionally sound than yeah. a non-organic yeah. one, yeah. we should pay you yeah. a premium. The premium shouldn't yeah. be for it should be for nutritionally, and that's what you're getting. No matter yeah. what you're growing yeah. yourself, it's always going to be more, more nutritionally balanced than you know one coming in from yeah. God knows where. Yeah. yeah, fresh, fresh, and local, and and uh, look, food yeah. miles mean more than just an environmental charge. No one wants to talk, but like we're an export, you know, an agricultural export country. So I suppose it's 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 a bit disingenuous of us to be talking about food, food in some ways. But at the same in time, time, what I what I find with food miles is the biggest detriment it has to, especially the likes of vegetables and fresh produces. It's it's starting to lose its energy density moving forward, and they're probably being harvested not so much at the right time. That most crops that have been harvested to export to come into this country would be harvested long before we'd consider them ripe because the idea is that they'll have them ripe by the time they arrive and that's an economic function i have no issue with that but definitely nutrient density among our own uh, growing for yourselves or for ourselves is 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 an area that i think is going to grow in major importance and i know all you do your 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 liquid uh, seaweed feed Th that yeah that, what do you think you you well, used that yourself or you've done trials yeah, but it yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I know there was research work done on a PhD many years ago on that. We, we you know, we'd be, we, we, we think it's a absolutely fantastic product, but uh, for many different applications. But I know in that particular trial in Kinsley, it was on I think cabbages, and two things came true. One was a peer-reviewed paper, which is basically, you know, it validates the the the. It's not just even a sort of a trial result. It's it's been assessed by a group of experts in that area and they felt it was worthy of publishing in a peer-reviewed paper but they were talking about an increase in the polyphenols and the antioxidants and uh, you know it's unfortunate most farmers are paid for kilos of produce when actually we should be paid for yes okay kilos of produce but how much um what's in this kilo of produce and i suppose that's what jill clapperton was i think that's who you're referring to yeah, jill she had, she had a sort of a spectrometer for measuring it. But yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Like if, if there's, a, there's an American study and a UK study uh, that came out sort of in the 90s showing that food in the last 40 to 60 years has declined in some of these macro and micro elements quite dramatically in some cases. So, like, I, I look, I have a head like a say volley, but and I keep, I use it at PowerPoints in some me, me talks. But, like, they say you, know, you might have to eat seven or eight apples to get what an apple would have given you maybe 50 years ago. You might have to eat three of this, and and, and that's all very relevant. So, you, I, I know that's not as big an issue with the people that you work with, Ollie, and the people are listening tonight because they're growing, their own. but it just does go back to showing you that, you know. It, it, it balance is something that's worth looking at and how can you improve slightly so as well as that in that trial the liquid seaweed was shown to improve uh, biological activity in the soil so it, it's just to show that most people would buy that to try and increase yield not so much the home gardeners they know you know they, they know that there's a, a sort of a higher value to it but most farmers uh, would buy that to try and cut anti-stress uh, on crops but also a yield increase when in actual fact it's probably shown its true colors in its sort of plant uh, immunity uh, boosting. Yeah. boosting capabilities and building internally these polyphenols and antioxidants which is really what's a lot of this let food be the medicine and and just n n nourishing food is about you know it is not and that's why it's what and I, you know i i've a great passion for nutrition and that's what that's what got me into growing my own and i wanted you know a, a fertilizer that was going to fulfill because this thing of you know gone out like i was going up where they were throwing 10 10 20 and they're 18 6 12 or whatever it was and the spuds and everything on the soil and 
it, it, yeah, it gives you a great boost of energy. But you want to keep your crop, as you said, something that's going to, you know, all your fertilizers should be always thinking of how am I going to feed, feed the soil first and feed what's in the soil, that it be the worms, all the microorganisms in there. And then that's going to relate back into your plant. And again, an, another thing I was actually, and I, I'd be talking about as well, like because people worry about different pests and disease they're getting in crops and in plants and polytons, green flies, stuff like that. And a lot of times there's a tendency to go to the weaker ones. Yeah. You know, a weaker a weaker plant will always nearly, yeah. um, the, the bugs and the, and the disease will gravitate to them. So, you know, so again, that, that's why I find, you know, treating them with, you know, a, a good a good balance of nutrition is, is very important to the soil. Yeah. Sorry, Ali, it just flipped up. My battery was running low. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. obviously a family member uh, plugged it out to plug in something else earlier but no and ju just when you mentioned that Ollie um, what what we're finding with, with, with all of that is that it, when I started on my journey into this it was a great friend of mine in England Neil Fuller sort of put me on this journey and I, I went to a couple of trips to America to a, a group called Acres USA and like it was a it was a very broad group of people from all sorts of backgrounds it was fantastic but they would have actually a lot of the key people who spoke at those events in the early years would have called things like aphids and green flies nature's garbage collectors so if they're at your plants something's yeah. wrong and they, they probably were a little bit harsh on because you know you we, we work with i'm a farmer myself we work with a lot of farmers and it's it, i don't mean it's not so simple as that but it, but there is an element of truth to that and, and you you alluded to it there you're finding in the glass house what tends to happen is it's mineral imbalances. And there's a lab in Holland we send SAP analysis to, and it, it's only in the last years, but they actually, it, they do a lot of testing on glasshouse and greenhouse crops. And they can show quite clearly through some of their trials um, that when there's an, an imbalance between nitrogen and potash, that both aphid green fly levels and mildew levels will increase in some of these plants so again it's it is tied into mineral imbalances we found we've got fantastic results with adding sulfur as a foliar to, to given plants a sort of an immunity boost to be more resistant naturally to diseases and that's cereals and and big crop veg you know we've played around with things in potatoes and seen amazing things change by maybe making sure that there's some zinc and sulfur down there with the potatoes now i'm not saying people will go to that trouble in home and garden, but I'm, I'm, it's just to show that nu nutrition does influence how crops perform. And, um, you know, there's, there's many references to that out there. It's a little bit tricky because when you're out, outdoor climatic conditions can change so quickly. But to be fair, um, it's it's a very important aspect to it, to it, Ali. Absolutely, no, it is, and just keeping it I, I, I definitely the natural thing to do with it, yeah, for sure. So, any other tips then? You know, I'm starting out in my garden, as you say, coming into the growing season. The potatoes, like a lot of people are putting in potatoes now, and um, you know, like I, I grow my potatoes, I throw I throw some handful of the mushroom pellet in now, and I sprinkle some um, to my seaweed powder on it. And normally, like every seed I have, I spray it with organic seaweed because obviously I have it, I'm not going to, yeah, you know, yeah. I. I no, but yeah. I, I do everything with the seaweed bar, drink it, to be honest with you. And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we drink it. <laughs> Have drank <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's not, I'm not saying, because every, every product is different, but yeah, 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 yeah. I take it. Even the seaweed meal, I take a sprinkle of that in the porridge. Genuinely. Yeah, no, so I, like, and I'm not, you know, you have to be careful, I suppose, where products come from and who's. But what I find... Um, it, it, Again, Ollie, there's things there. There's natural sulfate of potash. We would find that helps to boost tuber yields. And it's a natural product. You, well, you just, you, if you're, you know, if you look, for, you, there's an organic sulfate of potash. Uh, Keyserite is a magnesium sulfate. It's a nice fertilizer. It helps to, you know, potash is probably more important for yield than your, like, your tuber crop, your potatoes. So, to give an example on that, I suppose 20 plus years ago, most conventional farmers were putting out a uh, 100 plus units of nitrogen probably upwards on 100 units of p and probably 150 units of k to grow a crop of potatoes we started to look at change and some things like that and most of them are now on 60 to 70 units of nitrogen 30 to 60 units of p but they could be upwards on 300 units of k because that's what's growing the bulk tuber yield so again like now but then 
if you're not, I don't mean, you wouldn't want to be forcing crops. If you're at home in garden, I find it, it's just a quick soil test would tell you if you're deficient in K. If you're at a decent level, what we call index four in the Irish context of K, you'll actually grow a crop of tube or, you know, spuds, especially for your own use without any added potash. But if you were only at index one or two, uh, equivalent, uh, 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 maybe two bags to the acre equivalent, uh, you know, four or five bags to the hectare, uh, w w equivalent back down to me kilos per meter squared would 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 be a help to 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 bulk up tubers we call it or you use something like a, a tomato feed that's high in k especially when they come into flower and we find the seaweed before flowered and helps to keep the flowering going a bit longer not to let them flower too early that's a sign of stress and then if you need it to maybe you can for either if you I put some K in the soil, which is, we always say you have to feed the soil and the plant uh, because I know in the past some people have either been, well, we sell something for the soil, so we feed the soil. Oh, well, we sell something for plants, so you're better feeding the plant. It's actually not that. It's a, it, There's no one, It's a, we're a sort of a synergy of things that work, and what worked this year mightn't just work so well next year. We do find that a lot, but I think if you're looking for decent yields from a garden situation or raised beds, you definitely need to get the P's and K's up. The nitrogens, and that's been the difficulty over this, because if you spray even even compost, uh, especially if it's coming from leafy green material, you tend to get high nitrogen levels in that. You're not getting, you need to get the K up, you need thing, plants that have lignified. So you're looking at, you might have to add straw to that mix to get a nice balance of K in there. Or you buy a product that you know, the mushroom compost is low enough in nitrogen, you know, your mushroom pellets, low enough in nitrogen, decent enough in potash. Um, chicken and your pellets probably tend to be decent in right. nitrogen, low in P and decent in, in potash. So again, it's to pick the ones that, that balance out. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. I know that's what you just do a bit of research on what the plants actually need. Um, I just showed Maureen is just asking there about um, crop rotation is often mentioned. Is it necessary if you're adding nutrient compost every growing season? You won't see, uh, again, the whole idea of rotation in the past, and it's it's still as important today as it ever was. The idea of it in, initially was that people started to discover, I suppose when they moved from this sort of slash and burn agriculture, which was, you know, when they started to the farm, uh, oh God, you know, you, you, you break out, uh, you know, virgin soil, and oh my God, there's great yields or whatever you're growing. And then within a number of years, oh, something's not growing that way. You know, and monoculture mm -hmm. tends to be a problem. So, even even to move, if, if Maureen was moving her plants around the garden, it's that's in essence a rotation. I like to cover crops in between crops. They act as nearly a second buffer rotation. It, to me, rotation is as important as adding nutrients and compost. What tends to happen is if you add enough nutrients and compost, you, you can grow through some of these problems. Like if you take eelworm and potatoes, um, I suppose, you know, club root and brassicas, any of these, you know, it's it's to me rotation is still very important and if the more you can do for it yeah. now if you if you're struggling to get a rotation yourself among your crops because in some and i see this at home we, we like growing two or three things more than you know yeah. maybe we should be growing 10 or 20 things and it's difficult but if you can get into the habit of so if you harvest your potatoes if you could go in with uh the likes of a mustard green cover seed and there's, there's mm. ones out there that have higher sort of uh uh, extracts that'll that'll help get away from we'll say a, a build up of pests and diseases in potato ground so e like even in in commercial ground here we would be telling guys to avoid growing potatoes after carrots because of issues of, you know with violet root rot leading to other connected to things like and other things connected to sclerotinia so to us rotation is 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 vital but it's it's not to be all and end all uh, to the exclusion of everything else it's it's a, if you can do a bit of both and any effort you can make maureen uh, as i said if you can just stick in look oats is a great cover crop in, in front or after potatoes so at least when the potatoes come back if you're putting them in the same place next year technically there's been another crop growing for a few months in its place yeah. To, yeah. to just and it's all about like in nature the whole idea of rotation and multi-species we're big on this you know Throw, throw stuff in together so you know i suppose the three sisters idea in in the states where they planted the corn and the squash uh and together right. and, yeah but but like it, it actually does trick 
like you know there's some great work done at a farm scale level with the Dakota Lakes Research Center showing that um and the USD on weed, reducing the need for chemical weed control. And it was all about getting a number of rotations going, a wide rotation, plus a, a lot of cover crops in between it. And they were basically, you know, in some cases fit to do without herbicide in some crops in some years. We have commercial growers that are actually combining what we call companion cropping. So they'll grow, and this is a gardener's trick from, from over the years, but they'll grow maybe oats with the, with the beans, and it means there's a reduction in herbicide at the start, and uh, things like phacelia in, in oilseed rape. So all of that is designed to trick trick the soil. You know, it's an amazing thing. You're, you're feeding different exits, you see. And if you look at things like kale and some of those crops, they'll pull up. So if you take a soil and people, the experts in soil, oh, that, that soil is low in pH, it's low in calcium. But if you put kale into that field, it'll show up high in calcium. Because it has the, the root exit, it has the, 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 the ability to pull yeah. calcium from the soil. If you put wheat or if you put barley into that soil, it could start a half day and fail because it can't extract the calcium so easily. So again, sometimes it's about what plants we put in. And, and you'll see, you'll hear a lot more about companion cropping and multi-species yeah. type things. And uh, we even said the, the year, I don't know whether you were with us in Carlingford, Ollie, we ran a farm course in Carlingford a few years ago and we, we cover crop trials on a little, we did a farm visit as part of that. And uh, where we had all, just oats in the mix, there was mildew in the oats. Next plot to it was oats and, and oilseed rape, Pr pretty much half the mildew because that second plant was upsetting how even the nature in the field seen it. So monoculture isn't a great thing. Um, it, it's hard when you're, well, home gardening is easier because you can pull something out from beside something if you want. But on, on farm scale, it's more difficult. But it's, it's, it's gaining a little bit of ground. There's great work being done in England at the moment on it. And hopefully that learning will start to come more in fruition here over the next few years. Oh, um, no, I see. What... Yeah, James is saying there about cow manure helps to structure the stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yep, well yep. broken. Support, yeah, if I, I was going to say if you could comp if it's slurry, Seamus, if you can get biological type inoculants to break down the slurry and, and sort of what we call compost it as opposed to putting out maybe uh, uh, maybe lift the pH, you know, and just make it a far more soil friendly manure. If it's farmyard manure, you know, if you go back to the old days and the old people, they would have turned that manure maybe, I don't know, many times in, in a season. And so it never went out fresh. It went out that it was actually rotted, broken down. And rotted's the wrong word, sort of composted or, or degraded. We would find, uh, if, yeah, if yeah. we talk about rotting, and sometimes you go out to a field and you turn over a saw with a spade. And we always tell people, go out and pooch, have a dig. But you turn over and you see last year's straw residue underneath from, we say, conventional cereals. And if you have a sniff of the soil, which that's again what we recommend people who you just know it's a, it's like a formaldehyde, it's like an alcohol, it's like it's a wee bit, it's sour, and it might be just in that area, but that's because that's whereas it does nothing there to break down that stubble uh, properly to help the microbes, you know. So cover crops kick in, but if, if she like even if, if somebody had say a little dunkel at the end of the garden to throw some nettle seed oat seed grass seed on top of that dunkel and come back you know even uh, an amazing change in it because you've now got roots growing down into it they're working it they're taking it up they're releasing it back down so yes. you know and and this you know the, the likes of the wormeries and and worms are a fantastic management tool yeah. like you know they, they do so much they're, they're pretty much you know they're an underrated um soil worker and and they do so much for e even ecosystems for clean water for aeration drainage everything like that you know so they, you'd want a night for worms eh, ollie they, you would yeah. not look at the one on my so, worm tower actually because that's why we i don't know whether you've seen the worm towers we have and you put them into the middle of your raised bed and you put the worms in the, the compost worm in the bottom but i have them now in a number of different raised beds and i've been watching them all over the winter and last summer and you can see actually like when you dig up the soil a little bit you can actually see where the earthworm is coming in robbing the castings and there's a lot more worm yeah. activity going on yeah. the soil where yeah. I didn't have, like i didn't have an under amount of them but i can see a lot more activity going on now and then yeah. because like i have maybe 
wormery over in a corner and then I've compot teeth with all that leaching down into the yeah. soil, at least with the yeah. worm power. Yeah. Going exactly where it needs into the plant and into the soil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And don't be afraid if you have that well the worm issue, you should be catching your, your vermi juice. But you see the yeah. see the, the compost heap or the the if and I know look it's always a dodge, dodgy one with, with rodents, but if you can make sure there's something like they can you can have something growing on that compost heap with to a certain extent, depends on how fresh it is. And you can have definitely make sure that you have something growing around it. Now that may only be a clover. You know, maybe a, a, a micro clover, a, a very low growth habit clover. It can be any plant. If providing they are growing around it and it's leaching a bit and losing a bit, it's, you know, the crops are, so the worst thing you could have is your compost heap in a very bare patch of the garden with nothing, because at least something growing very close will start to pick up. The roots will go in under it. And, you know, it's, it's little tricks like that. We always say, yeah. be kind, be kind to your soil, be kind to your, think of what would you, you know, a little bit of, like as we say the cover crops, it's it's just the same as putting on a nice coat on a on a on a wet evening, you, you know. And I I, I I I there's videos out there you can get of slow motion of what a raindrop, a really you know when you have a heavy rain shower, what that drop does and the explosion of soil up into the into the air, and like mm -hmm. that's yeah. that's what you're that's what you're trying to get. To. But again, we, we do believe in telling people, and some people think we're a bit crazy, but be kind to the soil and it'll be it'll be kind back and i know most home gardeners are you know you're 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 living in nature you're working in nature and it's 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 a symbiotic relationship you know absolutely i went out to my home place yesterday evening actually and um my father was after telling me he was out tilling the garden all evening he's 85 like yeah, he's yeah. a good half acre of garden like yeah. he's out with the tiller murray tiller and i said god there's yeah. some of the groups i'm in at the minute now they might shoot you for tilling your garden at the minute ah, they're no, all in no. Yeah, and I, yeah. he's not even going to be tilling. Actually, you're tilling yeah. it for the last second since I yeah. the last second eight years, so but, keep fucking tilling it. Yeah, I uh, know he's your feet, and and look, the beauty of that is, in fairness, there's a man that's actually like he's out there, his mind's on that job. It could be, you know, it, it does, and it's just it, it, that's what I'm saying to you. We get so much from it that it's not even about the amount of food we produce. So no. the, it's actually the fact that you're like I find that once you're in nature, you're you're everyone's calm or it's it's far better it's just there's, there's an energy there's a, ne a very positive energy back from it you know so you timed it well all of you and out when he was finished tilling the garden i'd say you timed that one well <laughs> well without dropping them out then i dropped them out a yearly supply of seaweed and um, <laughs> compost and that's so yeah, yeah. i do uh, oh actually there's a lad there mark sweeney i don't know do you know him he's wondering is phil green the best product in the market Probably is Mark when it's in a better pants bottle. <laughs> he's he's uh he's uh I, I, I see a picture of him popping up there. So uh I'm 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 uh I'm, I think Ollie he, he he I don't know whether he got married and I know Mark well, so uh I don't know whether he got married and if he didn't he should be now he's he's keeping <laughs> keeping that wee keeping that wee lassie <laughs> waiting too long. So uh, uh, yeah. we we but find it and just and, and I know Mark's sort of having a wee joke about that, but We've tested a lot of products over the years, and um, I, I, you know we'd have UCD. This is for agriculture. UCD Chagas data. Um, it's to us. It's it's pretty much the our best. Pro, you know our best product. We see it as like if you look, if you go abroad, seaweeds far more appreciated because they don't yeah. you, they don't have their own natural sources in a lot of countries and i think that's probably something that's missing here but i think there is a great understanding and we're still only scratching the surface some fantastic yeah. research working on in queen's university belfast looking at how it's you know s starting off and and up up oh, i think they call it uplifting and downlifting genes uh, you know for stress and all that so um i know marks i see his, his, his smiley face there but yeah look and 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 that's just something we're still only scratching the surface about understanding and learning. We like it. it. It does a lot more than it says on the tin. It 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 feeds soil life. It it anti stress things like that. You know. Yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. So look at one last one there from uh, Bastian. Is it? What is? Uh, what about humix? Humix. Well, I know um, Ali. Uh, your your. You sort of you'd you'd have you you'd have humix in some of your products, and yeah. the whole idea there is that you're actually putting this you know, you're supercharging or you're 
it's how would you say it? It's a quick kickstart to the soil instead of having to put in an awful lot of organic material to build up the humus uh, and, and organic matter levels. We would always count humus as the secondary. Um, you know, organic matter is organic matter. Humus is really when that's broken down to where it can't be broken down anymore. And that's what you want to see really high in soils because that's it's it's so resilient then and it's binding your soil and it helps you know as i said it's the double win-win it let water through when it's in excess but it let it filter through in a slow way in a measured way and it and it'll soak more up so i know look there's some irish government in some cases are starting to look about increasing the, the humic activity around certain flood plains uh, to see can it you know help to deal with these floods but the one thing i'd say to you on, on just to answer that question uh, we would have done a lot of work with humix trial work on on potatoes commercial crops of potatoes and we're seeing you know quite large yield increases and we've started in the last year to trial it on cereals we're convinced of it why we're looking at it so hard at the moment is there's a big push on again to go back to the eu to, as part of their soil mission to have also a green deal and the farm to fork strategy and that's trying to get farmers and veg commercial well everyone you know that's in the in the business of using nu nutrients especially nitrogen to reduce by at least 20 percent and we see the humic acid type products uh, as having a major uh, a major positive on increasing what we call nitrogen use efficiency so yes the humix to me are a a, a, a big a big uh, a big positive in in soil the one we you, some people i suppose you mentioned earlier about dressing um, your potatoes, Ollie, with the with the seaweed. Uh, the the yeah. one the one thing we we if we, we'd say to people, don't don't dress potatoes with uh, the, any humic acid. Sometimes it can it depends on the pH of the product, but it can interfere with maybe germination. So not not in the soil. We've placed it beside potatoes, no no problem. But um, just dressing the seed. And again, it's 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 just one of those things. But seaweed's fantastic. Now, humic acid dressed on cereal seed or cover crop seed, big lifts in 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 in, in root mass and production. That's what you're trying to do with it. You're trying to see can you increase this living root mass that'll pull in more of the fertilizer that's in the soil, and 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 also um, that you've applied as part of your fertilization strategy. So, but but look, seaweed and humic acids both probably. Uh, brilliant products and very much underrated at the moment but definitely in the next few years i think you'll see there's actually a commercial nitrogen company at the moment dressing um nitrogen fertilizer for 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 farms with a coat and a seaweed and seeing some nice reductions in the amount of nitrogen needed right. to grow the same amount of grass or wheat or cereal so there are people are only starting to really waken up to the yes. to the to the benefits of them yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so that's that's it all for tonight i think we'll um call it a night and um guys thank you so much um for coming on and watching this talk and um, again we do them every wednesday evening and we have a special guest so again robbie thank you so much much appreciate you taking your time yeah. to come in and uh, educate us because i always get a wealth of information i took down a load of notes no, there for myself no, not at all uh, thanks a million for the opportunity ollie and, and in fairness you're, you're doing great things to, to bring knowledge to people because I think so in the old some some people in the past it was about saying well I'm the expert or we're the expert and that's not the case you, you want people you want to empower people and give them give them the ability to to you know to go out and and do things and we always say this look if, if someone's willing to go out and look at their own soil and spend a bit of time and study it they learn a lot themselves we learn more from growers of of fruit and veg and cereals and potatoes than 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 we do from books because the sometimes it's just the fact that growers like your own gardeners commercial farmers that don't have enough time to nearly sit down and think that they know things and it's only when we get maybe sitting down with them and have a chat and as i said we learn so much so it's a, it's a real but as i said gardening it's 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 a it's a, it's, a, it's a it's a blessing and a gift as opposed to a chore there's times of the year probably yeah. everyone f feel doesn't feel like that but uh, no. uh definitely enjoy it and fair play to you uh, i know i know you've yeah. uh, you, you put a lot into it ollie so so uh, well done yeah, no, and, and fair play yeah, yeah. thanks so a million thanks very much see you all. i'll see you all next week bye 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 bye